Hello everybody, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. Uh, welcome to uh, this uh, second uh, workshop, scientific workshop, organized uh, jointly by uh, Rob Agri and uh, INRAE about uh, <laughs> uh, agricultural robotics. Uh, so, hop, toodum. Uh, first of all, uh, we will have a short introduction about uh, what is Robagri Associations and uh, why we are uh, organizing such a scientific workshop. Uh, I will uh, do these presentations and I will uh, moderate and share these sessions together with uh, Stéphane uh, Durand, uh, which is uh, the, uh, the chef, uh, <coughs> project chief of the associations. Uh, so, who is Robagri? So, Robagri is an uh, association which has been uh, founded in uh, 2017. And uh, the objective of this association is to make possible uh, the, uh, the robotic solutions to go on the market for agricultural tasks in order uh, to permit the transition of uh, uh, the ecological transition of uh, agriculture and help farmers in everyday life. So if you want to uh, propose some uh, market and efficient solutions, we have to, uh, to solve some operational challenge. And as we are working uh, <coughs> with uh, several partners, we can find that these operational challenge are also uh, confronted to uh, scientific issues. And the objective of Robagri, of Robagri is to put together uh, scientific developments and um, um, development from private company in order to uh, make shared developments. And uh, the idea of the association is to uh, promote and to share um, several tools for developments, uh, so algorithms, uh, simulations tools, uh, um, results testbed, result data set, and also uh, testing infrastructures and uh, put, put everybody together, uh, put everybody together uh, to uh, make some new solution arises uh, which are efficient for uh, for farmers, usables, and uh, which propose a high level of uh, standard and safety. So uh, we bring together uh, 71 partners which are uh, classified into uh, several corps, uh, such as manufacturers, suppliers, uh, public research and labs, and uh, end user representative, so agriculture and robotics uh, uh, clusters. So uh, I'm Olona, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> I'm a researcher from NY and uh, I am in charge of the scientific uh, committee. And in, th in this scientific committee, uh, the idea is to uh, promote uh, the new developments, uh, new robotics developments, which uh, permits uh, robots to move uh, inside uh, off-road environments. Uh, so we have uh, achieved some uh, scientific workshops, uh, one uh, previous years in FIRA 2019, and so one more uh, this, uh, this year at FIRA 2020. But we are also organizing some scientific workshops uh, all along the year, depending on uh, the partner's uh, uh, need. Uh, we are also working on uh, building an algorithm database, simulations devices, uh, allowing people to use some standard uh, algorithms. And we are also uh, proposing some uh, uh, scientific uh, issues, uh, which has to be, um, to be addressed in order to make progresses in robotics. We are also involved in uh, technological uh, developments uh, about uh, safety analysis. We are uh, also putting together some infrastructure in order to propose uh, standard testing uh, procedures and evaluation processes. And uh, we are involved in some uh, actions in the DIH AgroboFood that you can see on uh, the FURA stand. Uh, we have uh, made a project in uh, France Agrimaire and we answer some uh, some uh, project call, uh, especially by uh, in order to build uh, a network of uh, scientific programs. So from a scientific pro point of view, uh, we are gathering um, all the competencies uh, of uh, about uh, 15 uh, main laboratories in robotics in France in all the topics uh, that uh, have to be addressed in order to develop uh, robotics. 
So uh, this is from a scientific point of view, and I let uh, Stéphane Durand uh, show some advances regarding uh, technological and uh, uh, association activities. Thank you, um, <clears throat> thank you, Roland. Um, so, um, what is um, particular about uh, Robagri Association? Um, in fact, uh, we've got a great uh, variety of um, actors um, and five axes uh, in order to develop um, a good ecosystem. Uh, the first one, uh, in fact, is norms and safety. Uh, we did have um, a lot of work uh, on this and started on this uh, on this part. The second one is to is working on tra technology transfer from research to industry. Uh, as you saw, uh, Roland uh, showed you, we've got a great range of uh, actors, uh, ranging from labs to um, industry and going to farmers. Um, our third uh, axis is to. Um, uh, to see which will be the future farmers' needs, and we work on this. Uh, the fourth one is testing and assessing machines' performances. And then the fifth one is really important. It's about representing the sector among the authorities. And I, I want to thank you, the, the French Minister of Agriculture, Mr. De Normandie, for quoting uh, our association as well as in, in Ray this morning uh, in his speech. Uh, we can go to the next uh, slide. And um, so uh, the message I want to, uh, to, tell, to tell you today, the, the most important message is that um, the more diverse you are and the, the better you represent the sector and the most efficiently uh, you tackle uh, technologies challenges. A few examples of what we did. Um, we did some um, common guidelines for risk uh, analysis. Uh, we also worked on a machinery directive with AXEMA. We made proposal for a regulatory uh, derogation for um, uh, test to test uh, in, um, road crossing in manual mode in rural areas. We also did some interviews about farmers to assess uh, their needs. And then we made uh, last um, May uh, 10 proposal for the robotics sector. And uh, we, we made it uh, to the French uh, Ministry of Agriculture and to the French state. Um, some of our next challenges are, uh, for example, um, working on cyber security, working also on the future needs of farmers and seeing uh, how they do evolve because there are many, um, the way uh, farmers crop uh, change radically uh, with climate change and other things and robotics is, is only one part of the solution. Um, we uh, also will work on um, algorithm database, as Roland said, and we may have also some challenges about GNSS uh, positioning. Um, so I'd like to finish and invite you, uh, I wish you a good, um, a good workshop uh, today and invite you after the workshop um, on behalf of our uh, board to our stand, probably stand, with uh, Jean-Michel Lebars you can contact, uh, which is, uh, who's uh, working at Kuhn uh, Society in machinery, and also Mr. Rebou, uh, which is uh, Robagri's vice president from INRAE, and I want also to thank you, Mr. Christian uh, Huig, which is deputy uh, director, scientific, at the INRAE from the, the supports uh, the support he gives to the association since it was uh, launched. Um, then you can chat also with uh, François Carpentier, uh, which is also vice president, uh, Dominique Bach, uh, treasurer from VTBOT, and uh, as well as myself. So uh, thanks for your attention. And Roland, as a president of the scientific committee of uh, Robagri, is going to talk um, about the, the, the next uh, developments of the uh, workshop. Okay, thank you very much, Stéphane. 
Uh, so uh, <coughs> we uh, have uh, this uh, scientific workshop which is decomposed in three sessions, one this afternoon and there will be uh, two other sessions. Uh, the main topic uh, of the scientific uh, workshop is uh, devoted to how uh, robots can adapt itself in order to make efficient work in a fraud context for agriculture. And uh, we will have this first session today about uh, decision making. And uh, we will have uh, four talks, and the first one will be given by Christian Wig, uh, which is a scientific deputy at INRAE. And he will talk about the opportunity of uh, robotics in order to make uh, arise uh, the ecological transition of uh, agriculture. So please, Christian, you can go ahead. Thank you very much, Roland, and um, thank you for giving uh, this introduction. It's indeed a pleasure to be with you this afternoon and uh, to give uh, this, uh, these few words uh, and especially to, to underline how robotics is contributing to the agroecological transition. Um, you all know about the importance of robotics for agriculture, what are the challenges, what are the, the stakes, and what are the, the possibilities that are offered. Offered um, just a few words to summarize the, this, this context and how how important it is. Um, we must not forget that uh, agriculture has uh, plenty of specificities, and at the moment worldwide, uh, we have a, a huge challenge that is to combine uh, several performances together. Of course, a productive performance uh, because we have to feed uh, the world population. Uh, I will come back to this in a, in a minute. Uh, economic performance, it has to be viable for the farmers, it has to be viable for the industry around, and of course, robotic industries, for instance, must be viable. Um, and uh, it, it must also, we, need, we also need environmental performance. And um, every report uh, that, has, that is run today on, on agriculture is showing that uh, over the last few decades, agriculture has uh, um, has a, an, ex an excessive impact on the environment. Um, it can be listed on the greenhouse gas emission, on biodiversity, air quality, water quality, everything. On all aspects, uh, we, we have a question. And also um, the social acceptance and the social performance of agriculture must be taken on board. Uh, so some of the elements of, of this, if we go a bit more into details, uh, about the contextual challenges. Of course, climate change is, is something that is visible for everyone. Um, I mentioned the, the, the word demand for food. Uh, it is increasing because of the total human population, but also because of the diet transition uh, that are um, occurring worldwide. Um, I mentioned the environmental challenges that are very important, and it is uh, extremely important to think the robotics in the context of the Green Deal that has been uh, announced in the European level, uh, at the European level uh, in, earlier this year, where we have, we have this uh, very complex objective of uh, uh, reducing the uh, greenhouse gas emission and going toward the carbon neutrality. Um, we have this objective of uh, reducing by 50% the use of pesticide and as other pesticides especially. Uh, reducing the nutrient losses, which is partly achieved by reduction of the fertilizer, but also changing a lot the, the, the practices and the, how animal and, uh, and crops are worked together. And eventually, there is a, also an objective of reducing the entry mic microbial um, uh, products uh, and antibiotics in the animal. So all this is, is, um, is inducing uh, a very complex uh, uh, set of, of uh, challenges. And there is one thing that is never mentioned, but that is, to my mind, something that is very important and has, has to be taken on board when we think about agro equipment and, and machinery and, and robotics, is the fact that uh, we have an underlying hypothesis, uh, or there are several items on that, but. Uh, especially there are two ways of uh, looking at the, the, the use of the agricultural land is are we either going to a, uh, land sharing, uh, which means using all the land in a sustainable way, or land sparing, 
which means uh, using only part of the land and preserving the rest. But it also means that we, man we then maximize uh, the, the, the productivity on the land that is used regardless of the impact. And this is very important because regarding for robotics because it, it will determine the, the, the type of activity we are going to expect from, from the robots. Uh, the second element uh, when we start thinking about robots is we have in, in, uh, in the back of our head the question of the work, uh, workload, labor, penibility. All this is a very important uh, problematic for, for robots and more bro broadly for, for farming and farming and, and yeah, farming situations. There are several reasons for that. Uh, the first is, uh, and it depends very much on, on where you are in the world, but uh, there are less and less uh, workers available in the, farm, in, in the farming systems, less and less farmers, either because uh, people are moving away to do something else or because the farmers are becoming old. And, and so this is a very, very important issue. Second point is that uh, are the jobs attractive or not? And uh, farming systems are not seen as being very attractive. And when you have a little bit of robotics and automatics coming in, uh, the aspect, the, the attractiveness of the jobs are changing. The third issue I already mentioned regarding the, the workload is the penibility. And, and the last item you don't have to forget about that is the security when running a work. Um, so these aspects are, are, um, are important when we consider robotics. But we also have to consider the specificities of robotics when we are dealing with agriculture. So what I'm going to say is, is seen from my own window, but uh, uh, I think I'm not too wrong. Uh, what is making robotics very special when you deal with agriculture? The first is that you work, uh, we work in natural environments or semi-natural when you are in greenhouses. And this, this means that uh, the environment is really or fairly unpredictable and, and fairly rough, uh, if I may use that word. The second is that we have access to a process with a huge uh, spatial variability. Uh, to illustrate why, what I want to say, for instance, if you ask a robot to uh, uh, weed and clean uh, and to make uh, weeding, uh, and even if he only has to deal with one species of, of weeds, uh, every plant is different. And so this, very, this variability is very, very important. Nothing is standard. And uh, this means um, that uh, when we design the sensors, when we design the algorithm, we have to take this on board. And clearly the transition, the agroecology, agroecology transition that I'm going to talk about a bit later is, is not going to simplify the story because we are going to look for more diversity, more spatial diversity, more heterogeneity within the canopies or within the, the, the flocks of the herds of animals. Uh, the third item of related with agriculture is the fact that compared with other activities, it's uh, an activity with low, ad, uh, low level of added value for most of, of our production, except what is taking place in greenhouses. But when you are dealing with a robot in the field, um, the, 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 the added value is, is fairly low. Third item we have to talk about when we deal with agriculture, beyond the fact that is that we have a lot of, we are in an envir a natural environment. We also have a strong dependency on local condition, which means that what is taking place in France, for instance, is not the same as what is taking place in Japan. The contexts are completely different. And what is taking place today in France is going to be different from what is going to take place tomorrow because of the weather condition. And all these aspects is making the story fairly unpredictable. And this is very, very important when defining uh, what a robot, robot has to do. Um, otherwise, without robot, is the human who is making all these decisions and taking on board the dependency to local condition. And then it has been clearly identified that this dependency to local condition that is increasing when you are going to a higher TRL level is clearly something that is hindering uh, and, and reducing the rate of adoption of an innovation. And the last aspect that has to be dealt with, dealt with when we talk about robotics in agriculture is the question of the uh, interdependency between the robots and the humans. And, and uh, 
possibly in agriculture because of the human activity, but also because of the perception by the society. We have to take a bit, a little bit more uh, this interaction into account. So when agriculture is then moving to agroecology, what is going to be changed? Uh, let's uh, first uh, define what agroecology is. Agroecology is one way of looking at the, the agriculture and considering that uh, uh, a crop or uh, a, a herd of animal is not uh, a herd or a crop, but it's an ecosystem. And it's an, an ecosystem that's uh, where the diversity is determining the process that are going to take place. And when, when we design, uh, and yeah, when we work for agroecology, what we look for is to maximize the natural and biolog biological regulation. And it has been demonstrated that when, you in when we increase the functional diversity in a crop or in a landscape, we get more uh, biological regulation more biological services. And among those, we uh, the most important are, are to get more fertility, so more possibility of production, and also more regulation of the, uh, of the weeds and, and uh, weeds disease and, and pests. And this means that when we go for um, agroecology, we go for more complexity, more diversity. It's important for the uh, the robots, but it's also very important for them because it means usually more work, but more complexity also induce more adversity to risk. The risk adverse, uh, we are uh, humans are risk adverse, uh, and we tend we tend to get away from the risk. And the point then for for robotic is how robotics in uh, agroecology can help reducing this risk aversion. So the transition, um, the agroecology transition is, is uh, raising new challenges for, for robotics. Uh, <clears throat> and it, it clearly means that we do not have to think robotics for agroecology as robotics for conventional agriculture, uh, because uh, it means, uh, I, I said, we have to look for more um, uh, functional diversity. So when you look for a crop, it's not anymore a single species. It's, a, it's mixtures of species. It's also species combined with uh, companion species, uh, such as uh, living mulch. It also means uh, structures such as uh, agroforestry, or even really cropping, when you, which means that you drill the second crop before harvesting the previous one. And again, this is plenty of space where you have complexities and where robotics can provide something. So we have to imagine to think what robots can provide and what they can do in a different way. Um, I think what is very, very important is, uh, for instance, in crop protection. Uh, either we, we, we try to use the robots to do exactly the same as the humans, or we try to do things that are not accessible by humans, but accessible by robots. So to, to illustrate my, what I want to say is, uh, Let's try the example, or let's take the example of uh, uh, using the robot to cope with the uh, uh, plant health and crop health. Uh, if, you've, if you try to mimic what uh, a human is doing, you will try to get the robots to spray uh, where you see the disease. And because thanks to the robot and all the sensors, you can easily identify where are the, the organs with uh, disease or, or with test. Um, okay, in that case, you will do the same as the humans. But you can also use the robot for something else, which is not to spray, but to remove the organs. And in that case, uh, what you will achieve is to use the robot for, uh, in, to, for making or for running some prophylaxy. Prophylaxy is clearly by, is clearly targeting uh, a reduction of the disease or pest pressure. And in that case, robots is really providing or making it possible to achieve it in a very, in very nice way. Um, <clears throat> the, ne the next thing that robot can do for agroecology is to handle the very fine and very small uh, spatial heterogeneity. Uh, robots can be used for drilling and, and for drilling and sewing this complex uh, sword I mentioned, 
but also it can they can be used to uh, to manage them to to weed to, to control the weeds and also to harvest in a in a very nice way. And the, the last thing that robots can provide uh, because of the of all the sensors is uh, if I try to use it in a small sentence is to make visible what is invisible. What is invisible is the, the disease and the pest before you before they are well expanded. Um, and it's there's been a uh, plenty of nice examples on apple scab, for instance. Uh, when you have this disease, uh, the, the Latin name is Venturia inequalis, coming into a, an apple orchard, um, you tend to see, or you, on average, you see the, the symptom. Uh, or the symptoms are seen by human eyes about 12 days after inoculation. But the sensors are able to see them after the second day, and. And simply the robots are going to be able, because of the sensors, sensors, sensors and the artificial intelligence, they are going to be make to make this invisible part visible from the second day. And I think this is something that is very important. Two, two last things uh, uh, regarding uh, agroecology and robotics. Uh, the, the first one is uh, is the fact that. Uh, robotics has an advantage on all the other sectors regarding the agroecology transition. The classical, uh, I will say that robotics is not, is not yet a classical sector. In the classical sector, such as uh, uh, pesticide or biopesticide, genetics or plant breeding or animal breeding, or agri or machinery, all these mature sector, uh, there are plenty in, in the um, uh, in, in the existing system, they all look for economy of scale, um, and uh, which means that uh, the, the, these mature technology have been uh, um, they have been run on la large uh, issues, and and all the alternative technologies have really a lot of difficulties to go there, and and because they are not competitive. Robotic is not in the same situation because it's starting from scratch and, and it's providing simply something that is completely different. This is why I support the idea, not trying to mimic what is done with the classical technologies, but really looking for something that is completely different. And, and the last issue regarding robotics in, and in relation with agroecology and, and what I mentioned, land sharing, is the fact that um, the robotics, because of the uh, possibility to create fleets of robots, uh, has the ability to manage and to handle very large uh, areas. So it's, there is quite a, a challenge to make uh, uh, low-cost robotics to be able to, to run all these uh, large, large uh, areas. So this is what I wanted to say as an introduction. And the fact that uh, uh, we have robotics in, in France and in Europe, uh, is uh, putting uh, the France and the European countries in a very nice situation for for acting and for leading the the, the development of uh, of robotics in agriculture. Uh, I, I again thank and, and congratulate uh, Roland and Stefan and uh, and uh, the uh, the president of Rob Robagri for for setting this uh, uh, this workshop and this seminar. I think it, it fully meets the uh, it fully meets the expectation of the society. We will make benefit from the uh, plenty of uh, other sectors such as sensors, uh, uh, artificial intelligence, and clearly uh, the future of robotics is uh, is partly in the end of all those who are running this machine, but it's also very deeply in the interaction with other disciplines. Uh, and this is why the work on robot is so important for research institutes such as the INRAI. So thank you very much, and I wish the best to this FIRA. Okay, thank you very much, much uh, Christian. I forgot to, to mention that uh, you are able to ask some questions uh, in the box uh, for, for, for that. Uh, we will have time to have a small discussion at the end of the workshop, but uh, I, we can take just one short question. Uh, when uh, I uh, listen to you, Christian, I understand that without robotics, it will be hard to uh, to uh, do a agroecology transition. 
And uh, um, there is a question that uh, arises. If we have to use robots, uh, how can we help people to, uh, uh, for having uh, good formations to use robots? And what are the key topics uh, for training the operators uh, with respect to uh, you have in mind? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, Robotic is not the only condition to uh, to to achieve the the, the agroecology transition, but the robotics will help that, no doubt about that. So, uh, regarding your question and the fact that those who are going to run robotic cannot be simply um, specialists of robots, they have to be specialists also of biology, also of agronomy, uh, and maybe to some extent of social of social sciences. But clearly, the the, the those who are who are going to run and we will have to run the, uh, the robotics in agriculture. They need to be to have both uh, both competencies. They must be very good agronomists and, and animal biologists at the same time as they are uh, specialists in robotics. Otherwise, you will make machinery uh, not starting from the objective. So uh, uh, there, there is a huge need for co-conception of, of the robots and. Uh, Maybe all the approaches, I did not mention that, but the, the emerging approaches of, of living labs in agriculture, where we are co-conceiving the solution with the end users, maybe this, this would be a very nice option to test for robotics. So it's not simply a question of pushing uh, technology, but also to create this with the, uh, with the end users. And this is partly what I'm, when I mentioned the low-cost robotics, this is one uh, could be one way to achieve that by conceiving this with the end users. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Christian. It's time to uh, switch to the second presentation, uh, which will be made by the Thibaut Clement about uh, multispectral images processing and registration on 3D uh, point cloud for vineyard. Uh, so, uh, Thibaut. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, you can manage your presentation, right? Uh, Thibaut, uh, if you can hear me, can you uh, switch on your mic, your microphone? Thibaut, you have to unmute, unmute, sorry. So, perfect. Did that work? No, we have a small technical issue. So, <laughs> I'm sorry for this uh, issue. I have the feeling, Thibaut, that uh, you are uh, unmute, unmuted uh, on, the, on the platform. No, we can't hear you, Thibaut. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if there is a possibility to uh, fix that. Uh, okay, so uh, <coughs> maybe um, uh, Thibaut will uh, log off and uh, will uh, be back. Uh, during this time, maybe we can uh, exchange presentations. Or do we let uh, two minutes to uh, Thibaut to try to fix a problem? Dun -dun.
So, uh, waiting for uh, Thibaut, we can uh, ask a second question for you, Christian, because uh, there is a second question uh, about the size of uh, robo of uh, robot. Uh, if uh, we want to apply agroecology principle, uh, one of the uh, things um, is uh, about the, the compaction of soils when we are using uh, huge machines. Uh, do you think uh, that navigating in tight field environments such as agroforestry, uh, we have to be uh, light enough uh, to uh, avoid soil compaction? Or do you see a role for automating current larger machines? Do you think that robotics may um, permit to use uh, small machines or uh, robotics have to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to keep on working with big machines and try to uh, automatize big machines? I, I would go for, the, for the, the first option because there are more flexibility. And um, one, one thing we must have in mind uh, is the fact that uh, more and more we realize that uh, one of the key impacts of agriculture is uh, on, on biodiversity, which is very surprising, or it is to some extent surprising because agriculture is the main, main mode of, uh, of la land occupation and land use, but it's because the, the type of system we are running that we have a huge impact on biodiversity. And it has been demonstrated um, that when when the the mean uh, field of, field acreage is going beyond or is exceeding four hectares, which is very small, then there is a kind of um, um, yeah. There is an it's, it becomes inevitable to have a negative impact on biodiversity, and uh, which is really a really a key difficulty for agriculture because there is there are. In most countries in the world, in fact, uh, the mean uh, field acreage is, is far beyond for actors. So the, the, the point is then come, becoming how to create the condition for having uh, productive agriculture and small uh, size of fields. And it's clearly not for by looking for big machines. And this is where, again, robotics could help. And either you have only robots, so you have a combination of robots and, and uh, uh, man-drived uh, machines. But so I, I would definitely go for, for the first option. And as you mentioned, and as the question was, uh, the, the impact uh, on soil compaction is something that we must have in mind. And, and if you take, at the same time, soil compaction and biodiversity, what you see is that we must give more importance to the long-term impact. When you have a, a soil compaction, in fact, you, you get a problem for a long time. And when you have a loss of biodiversity, you get a problem for a long period of time. So I definitely think that we must, yeah, we, we must think on, on, on long-term perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, do uh, we have fixed the problem of Thibault? <laughs> no, apparently not. Uh, so what I propose, uh, uh, while uh, we can um, uh, try to fix the problem of uh, Thibaut Clemens, is to uh, switch uh, from the uh, third presentation to exchange uh, between Thibaut and uh, Peter Block. Uh, so Peter, if you hear us and if you can speak, uh, maybe you can uh, take uh, your own presentations about multispectral image um Sorry, uh, about uh, it's not a good one. Uh, about the development of a smart obstacle detection <coughs> uh, system for an autonomous circle robot. Is it okay for you? Yeah. Can you can you hear us? Perfectly. Thank you very much. Okay. Just a small check. <laughs> um, <laughs> Perfect. So um, yes, welcome. Um, my name is Peter Block, and hopefully you can see my colleague to the right, to your left which is uh, Koen van Bohemen, and we will give a presentation on the uh, development of a smart obstacle detection system for an autonomous orchid robot. Um, we will do this presentation with the two of us. Uh, most, most of the presentation will be done by my colleague Koen, uh, but I also will give a few uh, words on the detection algorithm we used. Um, 
So first myself, so my name is Peter Blok and I'm a researcher in uh, computer vision and robotics at Wageningen University in research. Um, and uh, the focus of our work and our expertise is uh, mainly on um, computer vision techniques for agricultural operations. So uh, last year we focused, last year we focused on autonomous selective harvesting. And now we're also developing uh, obstacle detection systems for autonomous robots. Um, and that's basically what we do within the Wageningen University. Um, and my colleague Kuhn next to me will also introduce himself now. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Yes, my name is Kuhn van Bohem and I also work at Wageningen University and research as a researcher in precision agriculture. Uh, focusing mainly on uh, autonomous sensing and acting in precision agriculture. Uh, and also one of the things I work on is uh, autonomous robot navigation, which we will be talking about today, of course. Uh, I would also like to introduce our partner researcher in this research project, which is Dr. Kim Gu Kwan, uh, who is also a researcher in smart farming, working at the Rural Development Administration in uh, South Korea, in the Republic of Korea. Uh, and he's focusing on smart spraying in orchards and also uh, autonomous navigation, starting in rice fields, but also working in orchards. Um, so let's dive into the presentation. So we would first like to explain a little bit about the, the challenge that we uh, were facing uh, for this research. Uh, and uh, then, of course, move on to uh, the uh, solutions that we uh, that we developed and uh, yeah then some more details about the hardware and the software of the setup that we built uh, and the workflow for our obstacle detection system and uh, we would like to end this presentation with a short video demonstration uh, and of course if there's any questions please put them in the, the question system and we will try to respond to them so let's start with the research challenge um, Actually, uh, at Wageningen University and Research, but also at the Rural Development Administration, we noticed that we are using more and more uh, robots in our uh, research work. And uh, these robots are becoming more and more autonomous, uh, or at least semi-autonomous, which means that uh, yeah, they, can, uh, they will decide themselves uh, what to do and how to respond to certain situations. Um, and we noticed that the research often focus, focuses on uh, the development and the application or applicability of these robots. Uh, however, uh, we all agree that safety, uh, both for humans, but also for the environment of the robot is, of course, uh, one of the most important aspects. Uh, and with this research project, we uh, aimed to actually improve the safety factor of the robot uh, by quite some, uh, some steps. So actually the challenge that we uh, set ourselves is to design a flexible, uh, minimalistic add-on safety system, which we could actually fit to well, not one robot, but multiple robots, as you can also see in the, in the slide, um, to actually uh, yeah, simply put this system uh, on top of an existing robot and make sure that this robot can safely operate in uh, yeah, as, as many uh, environments as possible. Um, and to make things yeah, simple uh, in terms of integration on the robot is that we said, okay, the system should have one output message, which simply tells the rest of the uh, intelligence on board the robot whether or not the environment is actually safe for the robot to proceed or whether or not it should stop because there is a dangerous situation. Um, so actually the use case that we uh, that we used to to develop this system is actually we were already working together with the rural development administration on an uh, autonomous orchard robot uh, so we built uh, a robot in 2018 and we used this robot uh, for autonomous navigation in orchards um, the navigation system was based on the data coming from two uh, LMS uh, 111 lidar systems uh, built by SIC uh, and um, these uh, data were used both for navigation, but also for a very simple, I always call it the quick and dirty obstacle detection system, as you can see on the right side of the slide. So you can see that we sort of have a safety region, which is visible as the white uh, triangle. And if an object is detected inside this region, the robot will stop. 
However, the LIDARs are only scanning in a 2D plane, which means that if an object is above or below the uh, plane, the scanning plane of the LIDAR, it will simply not be detected, and thus uh, dangerous situations can still exist. Um, then, of course, we set out to build our uh, obstacle detection system. And the first yeah, function that we needed to have is actually for the system to sense what was going on in the environment. Of course, there are multiple types of sensors available for this, uh, for this task. And we selected an RGBD camera, uh, which is uh, at this moment available for a couple of hundred euros, uh, and which provides actually a very rich data stream because it provides us with uh, conventional RGB images for which we have many processing techniques available to detect objects or to, uh, to see what's going on in the environment. But at the same time, this camera also provides us with depth information, which is actually connected one-on-one -on -one to the color image, allowing us to also have more information on any objects that we detect in the color image and uh, therefore giving us more information also on the distance to the robot of any detected objects. On top of that, the RGBD cameras can be very small. They are quite reliable as the technique has already existed for quite some years. They are also available in waterproof uh, housings, which uh, of course in an agricultural uh, environment is, uh, is a very good thing. Um, and as I already explained, these, these cameras are right now available for a couple of, one, of 100 euros, which makes them very affordable. Um, the next step that we had was, of course, the processing of the data. Uh, and um, to make this system uh, an, an add-on system to any existing robot, uh, we said that we wanted to have a standalone processing unit, uh, which actually uh, gave us uh, the, the processing power we needed only to process the data from the RGBD camera and not any other uh, intelligence which is uh, maybe existing on one robot but not on the other. Um, this processing uh, system should also use as little power as possible uh, because we are working with, uh, with, with, with robots which are mainly driven uh, by electric systems. And of course, we don't want to deplete the batteries uh, using our safety system. Um, and a last uh, but very important uh, uh, aspect was that these uh, systems should have a wide I.O. range, uh, allowing us to uh, communicate easily with uh, any system that's already existing on the robot. Um, for the uh, technique that we use to uh, process the image, also NVIDIA CUDA technologies were required. So this is also something that uh, we wanted the system to, uh, to have. Um, oh. So um, then uh, what we actually built was an, a quite straightforward obstacle detection module uh, where we started with receiving actually the RGB and depth images as two separate data streams uh, from uh, the RGBD camera. Um, first, we started with the RGB image, which, uh, which was analyzed using the YOLX++ deep learning uh, network. And uh, this uh, network actually was used to simply detect any objects which are visible in the image. And uh, by uh, tweaking the system, uh, we were able to actually observe uh, a, a rate of four frames per second in which we could analyze the, the, the color images. Then uh, second, any detected object that was visible inside the color image would be transferred, or at least the, uh, the object coordinates of the image would be transferred to the depth image, where of course, as the two images are one-on-one are -on -one copies, uh, we could also detect uh, the distance to actually the object that was detected in the color image. So on top, you can see the color image with the detections. And below, you can see the same, yeah, same object, but now the depth visualization, allowing us to calculate, actually taking into account the, the outline of this object, to calculate the distance between the robot or the camera and the object. Um, as you can also see uh, in the image below, that at this moment, uh, a person is within three meters of the robot. Uh, and this uh, triggers our system to actually tell the robot to stop. 
Um, but the system works slightly different because what we do is as long as there is no object detected within three meters, we actually send a message that the environment is safe. So the example that is visible on this slide will actually cause the detection system to stop sending out this safe message, telling the robot that it is no longer safe and thus the robot needs to stop. Of course, we are still debugging this system, uh, which means that we also create the images as you can see on the slide. Of course, this is no longer needed if we are going to put this, uh, this system into production. Um, so then, of course, after building the system, we moved on to testing. Uh, and for testing, we used the hardware, which is visible on this slide. Uh, we had a small robot, which was a ClearPod Robotics Husky A200 robot. Um, which already uh, contained an industrial PC, which we were using for other experiments, um, and which was also outfitted with a SIG LMS 111 uh, LiDAR for the execution of the navigation algorithm. Um, and actually what we did was simply add an Intel RealSense uh, RGBD camera. And with this small addition, which costs around 250 euros or maybe even less at this moment, uh, we were able to actually make the robot suitable for uh, deploying the uh, object detection system on because the industrial PC that was available on this uh, robot already uh, had a GPU, which uh, was able to perform CUDA-based uh, calculations. And thus, we could deploy our algorithm also on this uh, computer. Um, so let's dive a little bit deeper in how it actually works. Um, let's start with the navigation system, which was already existing before we started this research. Um, we had, of course, the SIG LMS 111 LiDAR system, which was uh, connected to the robot operating system on the industrial PC. And the robot uh, operating system was actually there to receive the data from the sensor and to parse it and to make it available uh, on the industrial PC for any algorithm that we would deploy to actually analyze this data. Um, we used the Python programming language to uh, actually develop a full navigation algorithm with state machine and so on. And this uh, navigation algorithm simply checked the location of a tree row on the left side of the robot and a tree row on the right side of the robot and calculated the robot's position, which should, of course, be exactly between these two tree rows. Um, after the calculations in Python, we again published a message to ROS, which uh, actually told the robot what to do. So the robot, as it came out of the factory is configured to uh, receive data from a specific ROS data stream, a ROS topic as it's called. Uh, and by publishing from our Python software uh, specific commands to the robot on this ROS data stream, we could actually interact with the robot and make the robot move in the way as we want it to move. So this was all existing. Of course, to make our system as easily implementable as possible, we actually connected for the obstacle detection system to what was already there. So we used a driver to integrate the data from the RealSense camera also into ROS, which again meant that all the data coming from the Intel RealSense camera was available on the data streams of ROS. Uh, and again, we used the Python programming language to actually uh, analyze this data. Um, this means that we used a Python implementation of the all act plus plus algorithm, uh, which allowed us to reach the four frames per second uh, speed in this, uh, this case. Um, as I said, the detection algorithm would check if there's any objects in the image. And if there's objects, it would use the depth image coming from the real sense to analyze the distance between the robot and the object. Uh, and after doing so, it was determined whether or not this object was within the three meters or further than three meters away from the robot. Of course, the three meters is just randomly chosen, and this can be adapted to suit the needs of any uh, user. Um, so if no object was detected within three meters, the Python software would send on a different data stream a message to the robot saying, OK, it is safe to drive, and the robot would actually take commands from the navigation system to drive. Uh, if it was unsafe, so if an object was detected within three meters, 
no safety message would be uh, published to ROS, and this meant that the robot would immediately stop driving. So this is, uh, in a quick explanation, the inside of our uh, of our system. So then we would like to go to a small video demonstration, which I will launch right now. show on the uh, question appearing um yes okay so let's return to the powerpoint presentation um which you should be seeing again right now um yep so this was a quick uh, presentation on on how uh, the system worked so now of course let's talk about performance uh, as we explained, uh, we were able to reach uh, an average imaging processing time of uh, 251 milliseconds uh, on an older GTX 1050 Ti GPU, which was integrated in our industrial PC. Um, this meant, of course, that if we would deploy the same system on uh, state-of-the-art hardware, so the newer, later generation uh, GPUs, we would be able to process even more images in, uh, in one second, of course. Um, and with some simple tests, we found out that the system was actually able to uh, detect certain objects, depending on their size, of course, if they were as far away as 15 meters. So this is, of course, something that is not important when the robot is driving slowly. But if speed increases, then of course you can imagine that it's important to yeah, look ahead and to make sure that uh, all the robot, all the objects, even though they are further away from the robot, are still detected in time, so that we uh, can be certain that the robot is able to slow down and stop uh, at uh, at the same time. Um, so I also see a question now coming in about uh, if four frames per second is actually enough uh, to, to be safe. Um, so yeah, thank you for the question. As we were already saying, uh, now at this moment, the robot is driving slowly, which means it's traveling at between uh, half a meter or one meter per second. Um, and um, of course, uh, the processing time uh, is, is still limiting. Uh, but what we can do, of course, is set this distance to a larger number. So right now we have set the system to stop at three meters from an object. Of course, if we think that uh, we need to be extra safe, we can increase this distance to maybe five meters. And that will give the robot more time to actually slow down and stop before actually uh, hitting any object. Um, then let's talk about some performance. So on the right side of the slide, you can see some uh, some uh, results that we have observed in, in actually uh, facing the robot with real obstacles, as you could already see in the video that we played. Um, so um, uh, we tested against six different types of obstacles where the person was, uh, of course, the most, uh, most uh, observed object. Uh, and uh, yeah, we could see that the robot was quickly responding to this person and uh, yeah, actually uh, for a person, but also for the other objects, we were able to stop in time. Um, so then a quick wrap up uh, showing what it actually helped our use case, yeah, the use case that we talked about before. So in the old situation, we had the data coming from the LiDAR system, which could uh, tell us that there was an object if it was uh, also visible in the scanning plane, in the 2D scanning plane of this LiDAR sensor. Um, and in the new situation, we have a full RGBD coverage of our scene, and we can detect what's going on, how far away it is, and of course, and that's the most important thing maybe, that we can program our robot now to respond differently 
also to different objects which are there. So if there's a person, we can maybe sound a horn telling the person to move. Of course, if there's a crate, we can sound our horn a hundred times, but the object will never move because we really need a human to come and pick up this crate and move it for us. Yeah, and that was also one of the questions someone asked, uh, is it able to drive it backwards? These kind of actions can be programmed if we spot something that cannot be moved, so a fixed obstacle, then we can uh, eventually also uh, drive backwards and evade the obstacle. Yes, so that was our presentation. Of course, thank you very much for your uh, attention. We still see some questions coming in. So are we allowed to answer some more? Or is the time already out? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you very much. <laughs> it's true that the time is running out. Uh, okay. You have answered uh, um, some questions during your talk, but I think that you can answer the questions uh, also during the next talk uh, by clicking the answer button. Okay, and thank you very much. We will, will try. Answer, and you can also uh, join the people because you have the email address who are, uh, which are um, written. So you can write also an email with uh, the answer. Thank you okay. again. Yeah, thank you, uh, and contact us if there are some more questions. Nice, <laughs> nice to have uh, you with us. Um, uh, I don't think we have uh, solved uh, the problem of uh, Thibault right now, but uh, it's on the way. Uh, so uh, hopefully I am sure that we will be able to have uh, at the end uh, the talk of uh, Thibault. So uh, let's switch to the presentation of uh, Ashley. Ashley, if you can uh, hear me. Uh, Ashley will present... Uh, uh, the talk uh, from Seva uh, regarding uh, the real-time adaptation of a robot's behavior to change in the environment and adapt its behavior. Uh, thank you, Roland. Uh, my name is Ashley Hill. Uh, I'm a PhD student working at the Seva List, and I'll be presenting my work on real-time adaptation of a robot's behavior to change in the environment. So let's start with a, bigger, a bit of context. Uh, sorry. Uh, mobile robots in agricultural context are used in many environments. For example, here on the right, we can have a, a, ro a tractor in a forest, in a field, or even on concrete on a road. Uh, to be able to manage these different environments, we need to have more and more performant perception modules, which luckily have been developed uh, up until now. However, these information of these perception modules tend to be underused, uh, leading to suboptimal performance or even sometimes even dangerous behaviors. Uh, hence the development of my uh, thesis, which is the uh, development of new methods exploiting the perception uh, information uh, tested in the context of agricultural mobile robotics with initial works on control loop parameter tuning for more accurate and safer control. Uh, this is to mean a uh, detuning of controller gains in order to improve the robot's behavior. So what is, first of all, a controller gain? A uh, controller gain is the reactivity of a controller with respect to an, uh, an error in order to converge to a given set point. What we would want from an optimal gain is a fast convergence to the set point, a non-oscillatory control, and to minimize the errors. There exists a lot of methods for tuning this gain, uh, empirical tuning by hand, uh, the algorithmic methods, such as the zeigler eccles method, or a black box optimizer in a simulation. Uh, however, having a constant gain uh, does have a few shortcomings, as the optimal gain will often depend in the changes in the environment, depending on the weather or on the terrain, changing in the perception quality, such as losing a GPS signal, or on the highly dynamic systems, such as the ground wheel interface, meaning that a constant gain is often very suboptimal. Uh, as such, uh, the known way to solve this problem is called gain scheduling. Uh, gain scheduling is when we have a specific gain for many cases, for example, at low speed, high speed, sunny or rainy weather. Uh, this gain has to be defined uh, for each one of these cases, and each case has to be uh, set by an expert. Uh, unfortunately, this method means that uh, the edge cases between each cases are quite uh, still suboptimal. Uh, in the previous example, if you go to a medium speed, uh, it will alternate between a gain that's too high and too low, which may cause instability. And it also doesn't generalize outside the configuration, meaning if there's a use case that hasn't been taken into account, such as losing signal on uh, a transmitter, it may cause instability in your systems that aren't taken into account by this, and that causes undesirable or even dangerous behaviors. Uh, so what is needed then? Well, we need a continuous way of tuning the gain, uh, hopefully in real time, so that it can be applied in robotic control. 
and also something that requires minimum prerequisite knowledge so that the method can be transferable not only to a given platform in a given context, but to multiple robots across the field of agriculture. Uh, as such, the natural candidates for these kind of solutions would be neural networks, as they are very fast to compute uh, in the order of milliseconds, and they also uh, can tune again uh, continuously. Uh, uh, the natural of, uh, way of tuning this neural network would be reinforcement learning, as these methods only require an environment to play in and a reward signal to describe how well the agent is doing in that environment. Let's talk about the method. Uh, the method as such described is the following. We have a controller that gives a control input to a robot. Uh, this robot sends back measurements. These measurements are observed. Uh, and from that observation, we can derive the errors that define the uh, next control input. Uh, if we insert our system inside uh, this control loop, we can have access to the state and the errors. And from this uh, information, we ask the neural network to predict a gain. This neural network obviously isn't perfect to begin with. We have to train it. And as such, we use an optimizer, which changes the parameters of the neural network depending on the input uh, of, the info, of the objective function. The natural optimizer that we would use in this context would be a time difference based reinforcement learning method. This is the method described by Richard Sutton, and it's the most known kind of reinforcement learning. If you've heard of DeepQN, uh, DQN, or uh, PPO, uh, proximal policy optimization, or A2C, advantage actor crit uh, critic, then these are the methods that uh, apply this. Uh, they're efficient because they can update every time step. So every time uh, an action is taken by the controller in the control loop, the, ag the neural network can update and uh, fine tune its, uh, its uh, choice of action. In these kind of environments, it can take up to a few minutes sometimes even to, uh, to get a decent enough behavior from the robot to actually use it in real world context. However, these solutions are often have trouble converging when the time step between two actions is very low. Uh, even something at, for example, 10 hertz, which can be seen as relatively slow in some contexts, uh, will filter out uh, the exploration. Uh, a neural network in reinforcement learning will tend to apply a noise to the output in order to explore the environment. Uh, when we apply this to a system with a lot of inertia, it will do cause a low pass filter, which will cancel out all the exploration, meaning the agent won't be able to explore the environment correctly. Furthermore, there's problems with, uh, with um, causality and credit attribution. So when you take an action, we are unsure when the reward will appear as uh, the systems are non-ideal. So there's delay between when you take an action and when the system reacts. And finally, there's always this problem uh, in robotics is the observability. There are many things that just simply are not observed with the sensors. As such, a different method is used. It's called uh, episodic policy optimization. Uh, where CMAES is the optimizer that is used. Uh, the drawbacks of these systems are they're very inefficient. Uh, the training must be episodic, meaning you have to split up your training into uh, given times or certain distances uh, set, uh, that are done. And also all the episodes have to be comparable between each other, which means they all have to be all either the same trajectory or the same speed. Uh, CMAS, uh, the optimizer that is used, is a stochastic evolutionary search algorithm where multiple neural networks are tested at the same time inside a simulation. And then they're selected the best of that set. And from that set, it derives new parameters for the next generation of neural networks. Uh, unfortunately, as it's testing multiple values, it has multiple neural networks, it has to be done in simulation. Uh, but once it's trained, it can then be put in real world conditions assuming your simulation is realistic enough to avoid the systemic error between your simulator and the real world results. The objective function that is used is a minimization of the lateral error denoted Y and the steering energy denoted delta F. So the idea is to follow a trajectory as close as possible without oscillating. Simulation is built uh, using a Petrisca model, uh, Petrisca, sorry, magic equation for the forces in a dynamic car-like uh, model. The controller used is a standard controller that is used in most agricultural uh, robotic systems. Uh, the one takeaway here is that KP and KD are the gains that are tuning. They represent the proportional and derivative of the error. Uh, sorry, the reactivity of the controller with respect to the error. Uh, the performance metric we use is not the objective function, as this can cause issues uh, due to a reward shaping, what is called reward shaping, when the agent finds a flaw in your system and is able to exploit the value without getting the behavior you want. So we use the surface error, which is uh, to do as our performance metric, uh, which is simply the surface error, uh, the surface 
between the robot's trajectory and the real trajectory. The higher it is, the further away the robot is from the trajectory on average. We apply then a trained neural network on the robot you can see on the left. It's called the RobiFast robot from Lina Rao. We tested it on two trajectories, trajectory one and trajectory two. Uh, the first one is uh, in the center is over gravel, then concrete, then grass. The idea is to see a variation of sliding condition of ground conditions. And on the right, it's a very long trajectory over a recently plowed field of wheat, which means the ground is quite uneven and very dusty, which gives a more realistic idea of what this, uh, of how the robot would be in context. Here are the view from above of the trajectories split into uh, initial corner or corner two and an end. So uh, let's look at the results. We're going to first show the neural network method called neural gain, and we're going to compare it with the uh, constant gain method. On the bottom left, you will see the uh, trajectory from above, and on the bottom right, the error. And that's visible on video one. If you can put video on one, please. So on the left, we have the neural gain method, and on the right, we have the constant gain method. On the bottom left, we can see the neural gain is converging quickly to the set point, whereas the constant gain cannot due to its constant reactivity. In the corners, the opposite occurs as the constant gain starts to oscillate with respect to the neural gain. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. So, uh, so, however, this is uh, slightly unrealistic as a constant gain is obviously uh, under under underreactive when we compare to. Uh, actually uh, methods that actually modulate the gain. As such, we also compared with a deterministic method for changing the gain in real time. And that's uh, video two, please. Here on the left, we have the neural gain, and on the right, the deterministic method. The initial convergence is similar. However, the deterministic gain struggles to converge directly to the set point, as we can see here due to the plateau. And in corners, we can see the neural gain is able to minimize its errors when compared to the deterministic method. Collecting these results, as um, we get the following uh, data. So above we have the lateral error, in the center we have the curvature, and below we have the uh, lab, the um, surface error. Sorry for each method. Uh, we can see that the neural gain is quite flat and converges very quickly to the set point, which allows it to have a 62% uh, decrease in the surface error when we compare with a constant gain method. However, the trajectories is quite short, so we don't see much difference between the deterministic and neural gain, as they didn't have uh, that much of a chance to actually compete with each other. Uh, hence, the second trajectory, where we throw it on the wheat field, and uh, this is visible on video three, please. Here, over the farmland, similar behavior can be observed in the initial section, where the neural gain converges quickly to the set point. In the first corner here, an interesting phenomenon starts to occur with the deterministic gain, where it starts to cut corners. This is due to the ground quality lowering considerably the reactivity of the deterministic gain. And further on, we can see the deterministic method struggles to minimize the error relative to the neural gain as seen on the bottom right. Thank you. Uh, collecting the results here, uh, we can see that most of the issues that the deterministic gain had was when there was a continuous corner, so in corner two towards the end, which caused a quite a strong offset that it had trouble correcting. This is because the deterministic gain can't correct for lateral errors very uh, well, which means that the neural gain method was capable of inching out a 43% reduction in the surface error. Uh, when we try and analyze the gain and how the gain is uh, ev um, evolving over time, as the advantage of this method really, instead of just directly controlling the steering, is we can actually understand uh, the behavior, we can actually compute, um, understand what the gain is and what it sh the values should approximately be, meaning we can put safeguards on these values and the neural network can't go out of bounds for some reason. But it also means we can't necessarily understand what the gains mean and what they actually do. So we do what's called a feature importance method which calculates the rate of change of the output with respect to the input of the neural network. The neural network is predicting KP, KD, the two gains, and the horizon H for the look ahead of the controller. 
uh, from importance from le uh, from uh, most important to least importance for predicting the gain is the target speed, the accuracy of your GPS, the rate of uh, the rate of change of your angular error, the future curvature, the current speed, uh, the cornering stiffness, which is an approximation uh, can be seen as an approximation of your surface uh, sliding, uh, how much you're sliding on the surface and why, which is your lateral error. So the neural network is using the combination of all these to be able to compute your ga the gains in real time. So I'll be brief on the conclusion. Uh, the advantage of this method is robot independent, it's control independent, and it requires only a system model, which means minimum prior knowledge. Uh, it can be optimized for a given task. Here we showed with the lateral error and the, and the, um, the cornering, but it can be also be used to minimize, for example, vibrations. It's adapting in real time to the observations it's, uh, it's uh, obtaining and it causes a 62% reduction in the surface error when compared to the constant gain and a 43% reduction in surface error when compared to the deterministic gain. It isn't without some limitations, however, because uh, the method is very specific to the uh, task specific to the objective function. You can't really transfer the task uh, to a different uh, function and it's very hard to define mathematically what you mean. Uh, for science scientifically, it's hard to avoid local optima uh, so that means reward shaping. There's no proof of convergence for the neural network, and it takes a long time to compute with these methods. But it's about a day on a processor. Uh, future works include dynamic, more dynamic simulation, uh, tuning the speed and the gain, and tuning more than just a controller, trying to tune the observers as well. Thank you for your time, and don't hesitate to ask questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ashley. Uh, I'm sorry we won't have uh, time to ask directly questions, but do not hesitate to ask questions in the box, and um, and uh, Ashley it will be able to answer. And you can also uh, uh, go on uh, the stands of uh, in high if you have questions related to this talk, uh, as we will be able to uh, transfer the question to uh, Ashley. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, hopefully we uh, found back uh, Thibault and then uh, we will be able to have the second presentation, uh, the second talk uh, at the end. Uh, but uh, we will have only 15 minutes, so sorry Thibault, but uh, if you can uh, make your presentation in 15 minutes, it would be good. Okay, okay. Can you hear me correctly? Yes, more or less. Thank you very okay. much. Thank you very much, sorry, for the uh, program. Uh, so I will be first. So we present a method to, uh, for the registration between a mixed spectral image and a 3D point cloud. So a registration between 2D information and a 3D information uh, from a vineyard or from plant, uh, etc. So I'm a PhD student from the laboratory uh, India. It's a laboratory of uh, computer vision, uh, imagery, imagery, artificial vision. I come from the uh, I come from the team uh, vision for, for robotics. Um, however, problematic. It's about uh, so as I said, it's about uh, the fusion of. Um, of uh, 2D information and uh, 3D information. So 2D information like uh, uh, color or like uh, multispectral uh, radiometric information uh, from plants uh, to fuse with the uh, 3D. That means uh, to have a, a 3D point cloud enriched by uh, 2D information like uh, multispectral. Um, and uh, how our method uh, works in real time. That means uh, uh, make uh, acquisition, uh, processing, and uh, fusion in real time. Uh, and this is to enable further vernier analysis uh, to improve, uh, to contrib contribute uh, to precision with culture or maybe uh, further application for Robot. Um, so we present uh, an algorithm, um, uh, an algorithm uh, working in real time. Uh, so, uh, so for that we use uh, two types of uh, of uh, main sensor, um, uh, 
especially a multispectral camera and an RGB camera. Uh, the multispectral camera uh, can uh, acquire uh, nine uh, spectral bands uh, in uh, one shot. Um, uh, uh, so and uh, each uh, so uh, one exhibition acquire uh, can be can acquire uh, main uh, spectral image um, with a resolution of uh, 439 by uh, 339 uh, pixels. Uh, for the RGBD camera, we use uh, Kinect. Uh, uh, the Kinect V2 is composed by uh, by an RGB cam RGB camera and the um, depth camera. Um, uh, and uh, the, it is very useful because uh, it works uh, outdoor. Uh, for the platform, we use uh, a robot commit uh, uh, from a uh, company robot, robot mix with uh, four electrical motors. And uh, there is a, a computer embedded uh, and uh, several sensors uh, embedded in this, uh, in this robot. Um, for software, we use uh, all the um, um, all the algorithms uh, work uh, under Ubuntu 18 and uh, was uh, Melody. Uh, so we use uh, C++, Python, and uh, we use um, especially a computer vision library of uh, OpenCV. Um, so I detail uh, some steps of the algorithm. Uh, first step is to demo it's a demo is a thing of uh, the raw image of the mid spectral camera um, because uh, uh, the mid spectral camera acquires a raw image uh, on the left uh, uh, composed by uh, uh, super pixel three by three. So we need to demo uh, this uh, image to create a, a nine spectral image. Uh, so after we can uh, we can use a pre-processing function uh, to uh, denoise or or to for calibration uh, uh, to calibrate the camera, and after that we can process the uh, uh, spectral to create. Uh, to compute uh, some uh, algonomic index, like, uh, for example, here, uh, we can compute uh, the NDVI, normal, uh, normalized differential vegetation index. Um, so on the left is the uh, NDVI image. Uh, we apply uh, we apply the color the system map to to different state uh, vegetation. And uh, on the right, uh, it, uh, we apply the uh, pre-processing function to denoise the pixel. And uh, with that, we can um, segment a very well uh, vegetation uh, with uh, very basic uh, segmentation tools. Um, and uh, uh, in, we make a lot of experiments, and uh, in Vineyard, uh, we have the same type of results. Um, so, um, so for pre-processing, uh, so after acquire mid uh pre-processing and processing function uh, of uh, mid spectral images, we can now uh, register. Uh, we can now uh, our aim is to register the mid-spectral mid image with the depth image of the Kinect. Um, the depth image of the Kinect is already um, is already registered. It's factory registered with the RGB camera of the Kinect. So our work is only to uh, uh, 
uh, our work is to find the translation and rotation between the mid-spectral image and the RGB image. Uh, so for that, we use uh, um, uh, a common uh, method uh, uh, of uh, extrinsic uh, calibration uh, that tends to place uh, uh, to put uh, a chessboard in the field of view of the two cameras. Uh, on the left, uh, it's the image of the mid spectral camera. On the right, it's the red, uh, the red channel of the RGB image of the Kinect. And uh, uh, it computes uh, the, uh, uh, with its function, it uh, detects the chessboard, and it computes uh, translation and rotation and uh, the difference of size between the two, between the two images. And uh, it saves uh, uh, it saves uh, an homography, and this uh, homography can be used uh, to realign uh, the two images uh, uh, after or, or, or during the uh, addition. So we made a lot of experiments in Vanyard. Uh, of two sensors uh, 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 on, on this robot. Uh, we made the acquisition in September um, before the harvest and uh, after the harvest. Um, uh, so we, we have been uh, to summarize the results we obtained for the month. Um, so we acquire a, a group of uh, uh, three images, depth, depth image, RGB image, and uh, mid-spectral image. Um, we can uh, re uh, uh, we apply the homography to RGB and uh, Z. So at the end, we have uh, RGB and Z um, aligned with uh, mid spectral. And uh, with mid spectral, we can compute some uh, and some uh, uh, some agronomic index taken with the eye. And uh, so with the image with the depth image uh, with the depth image. Uh, we can generate a uh, 3D point cloud. Uh, uh, get image. And uh, this point cloud is uh, colored by uh, NDVI. Um, uh, so to conclude, uh, uh, we did, we have developed uh, uh, a network uh, working in real time to acquire uh, several modalities of image, several, uh, several modalities, with spectral RGB, and uh, this, uh, we can pre-process and uh, pre-process uh, uh, the mid spectral and uh, and uh, restrict uh, in uh, uh, this uh, free image. Uh, all the code is uh, on the, in open source, uh, accessible by this link, and, um, and uh, this work it's the beginning of a project to make a further analysis uh, uh, of the vineyard. And we think that uh, combining uh, mid spectral and the 3D, uh, combining multi modalities uh, can be allowed us to make a uh, good name, uh, to make a uh, good name. Thank you. Uh, uh,
thank you for your time, uh, for your attention. Uh, I'm very sorry for the problem uh, with connection. Hopefully, we uh, succeed in uh, finding a solution. Thank you very much, Thibault. Uh, unfortunately, we are running out of time, so uh, we won't have time to have uh, some questions at the end of the of this session. Uh, but anyway, uh, you can find back all the summaries on uh, the Robagri booth. So if you have questions, you can go to the booth of Robagri, ask directly to someone, or see the summaries and uh, send an email to uh, the authors. And uh, <clears throat> then you can, uh, you will be able to uh, have some answer to your questions. I would like to thanks again uh, all the speakers, and I would like to thank you for your uh, attentions. Uh, this is uh, the end of the first uh, sessions, and uh, we have two other sessions of the Inrai Robagri uh, workshop uh, tomorrow morning and uh, Thursday in the afternoon. So I thank you very much, uh, all of you and all of the speakers, and I give you a, a rendezvous on the FIRA. And thanks uh, to the FIRA again uh, for welcoming us uh, as a workshop of the FIRA show. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.